Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Baldwin's Unlocking Potential podcast series. I'm your host, Tyler Kern. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Now, running a printing business with today's multitude of unique challenges requires creative recruiting to find, maintain, and expand your workforce. Printers are not alone, as manufacturing organizations of all shapes and sizes are struggling to find and retain employees with the skills required not only to get critical jobs done, but to high standards. With the great resignation that began with the onset of the pandemic, employees aren't just quitting, they're also retiring at record rates. To retain the talents of these valuable, seasoned experts and pass them on to the next generation, employers can implement a variety of workplace practices, many of which can benefit all workers and make good business sense. With more than 75 million baby boomers retiring sooner rather than later, the time is now to have a solid plan in action for replacing exiting workers. We welcome our special guest today, Adrian. Harrison, VP of HR Consulting at Printing United Alliance, and uh, she's joined us today as our special guest with ideas and actionable steps for an effective recruiting and retention program and for becoming an employer of choice. So, Adrian, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks for having me, everybody. Absolutely. We are thrilled to have you here on the podcast with us here today, Adrian. And joining her from Baldwin are Rich Bennett, president of Baldwin's AMS Spectral UV Business Unit and engineering leader, Mike Nelson. Rich and Mike, thank you guys so much for joining us here today. Yeah, pleasure. Yeah. Excellent, excellent stuff. So Adrian, let's start off with you. Tell us about yourself a little bit more and tell us about your role with Printing United. Uh I am a HR consultant with Printing United Alliance, which means that I don't do the internal HR at the company, but I interface with our printing members across the United States, Canada, and uh, places all, all over the world, really. And so what I try to do is come up with strategies to help people with exactly the problem we're talking about today, which is to find um, sources of workers how to staff and re retain our existing workers, sort of, you know, look, we can't mint new people. So how do we get and keep the people that we have, right? And so that's what I do. And then on a, um, a separate note, I help with day-to-day -day HR issues and sort of advise on regulatory issues that affect human resources. Fantastic stuff. Well, you are the perfect person to have on the podcast today. <laughs> uh, Rich and Mike, tell us a little bit about your roles as well at, at Baldwin. Uh, Rich, kick us off. Yeah, uh, so I've been with Baldwin since about 2003 in various roles, um, uh, mostly through our operations and our aftermarket group and got the opportunity uh, about three years ago to, to take over as president of uh, AMS Spectral as we made some changes in the company and divided up into, into different business units. So uh, it's been a, been a fun ride with this and it's been a good experience and um, just, uh, you know, happy to keep continuing to grow our business and, you know, provide uh, our products to the print and, and other uh, parts of the industry. So, Fantastic stuff. Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role. Yep. So I'm the engineering leader here at uh, the River Falls segment of the of AMS Spectral UV, uh, the Baldwin Technology Group. Um, I've been with the company for since 2015, and then in 2018, I was promoted to the engineering uh, leader. So before 2018, I was actually I just grad. I came to Baldwin right out of college. Um, started as a manufacturing engineer, kind of worked my way up, and then um, that's where I'm sitting today. So, Well, it's fantastic to have so many different perspectives here on the podcast today, and I think that's going to give us a really well-rounded view for our topic as we talk about the great resignation or maybe the not-so-great resignation, depending on your perspective. Uh, so, Adrian, let's start off here. The great resignation, tell us about its impact, specifically in the world of printing, from your bird's-eye view of the industry. So we already had an issue before the pandemic with people leaving our companies. A lot of it is because we aged out, right? That was part of it. The other part is is printers weren't keeping up with trends, both compensation trends and benefit trends that made us less desirable places to work as opposed to some of our um, competitors. And those competitors aren't other printers necessarily, it's other manufacturing, it's retail, it's healthcare, it's other semi-skilled, skilled services uh, industries. So, so we had a problem coming in. 
Um, the great resignation for us really was people leaving because they're older, more mature employees and they didn't want to come back to um, a potentially health risk situation for them. That's part of it. And because printers tend to have employees on the higher end of the age spectrum, it affected us a little bit more, I think, than some other industries. That's one thing. The second thing is, is it was in some ways a house cleaning. It caused people to rethink their business operations, their processes, and become more um, efficient and more lean, if you will, in how they approach the workforce. So part of the departures led us to better business practices. You know, you can't waste a good crisis, right? We can improve out of a bad situation, and I believe that many, many printers have done that. The other loss was caregivers. So because um, elderly people or, you know, uh, what do they call you, the sandwich generation, where you have younger kids and older parents and you have to take care of people, a lot of women left the workforce, and so I think our industry, as well as many others, saw an exodus of women from from the workforce and they haven't returned in the same numbers that men have returned post pandemic, if we are in fact post pandemic, but yeah, currently. Yeah, you, you made some some really excellent points there and, and highlighted some of the major issues that we're seeing in the industry. And then, you know, it, it's, a, it's a case by case basis for a lot of folks, you know, the pandemic accelerated some plans to leave the worker workforce and then for others, it kind of put them off and delayed them a little bit, right? And so you're seeing organizations respond in different ways to present alternatives to that standard retirement with, you know, scaled down schedules that allow younger workers to benefit from mature workers, you know, specialized experience and, and the value that they can provide in that way. Can you speak to this trend of maybe altering schedules or doing different things to try to work with people to, so as to not lose all of this experience all at once? Yeah, absolutely. So Tyler, I come into this conversation with two key points and takeaways that I want the audience to get. One is the critical issue of flexibility. And this is flexibility with shift schedules. This is flexibility with benefits. This is flexibility with the choices of who you hire. I think that that is a very um, strong uh culture shift that we need to make. The second is looking in over for workers who are overlooked. But let's talk about flexibility. I think we have to realize that we have to meet people where they are. We are no longer in a position where we can tell people, this is the hours you work, period, end of story. We don't wanna hear about how you have better ideas about shift schedules. We can't do that anymore. People are just gonna make other choices. They're gonna go work other places that will work with them on flexible schedules. My suggestion has been to reconsider your shift start times and end times. Recon so, you know, if you have a seven o'clock start shift, you may want to start it at eight because that allows caregivers to get their children to school or in preschool programs that will then put their kids in the classroom at the right time of day. So that's one thing. So start and end times. The other is to consider instead of having a five day, eight hour shift schedule, have a four day, 10 hour shift schedule and split those 10 hour days into two five hour shifts. That way you're going to pick up people who can work part time but not full time. And that shift schedule will allow them to take care of younger people and perhaps elderly or older individuals that they have to take care of. So these are sort of the ideas, sort of the components of a flexible shift scheduling that you look at and consider your audience, consider your market area and start looking for changes that will accommodate people and meet them where they are. The other benefit to having a four day shift schedule is that all overtime can be scheduled for Fridays, which still allows people to be home on weekends. And those weekends, is it are, those are the brunt of caregiving times, right? Kids are not out of school, parents aren't in day facilities, things like that. So I think these are really important points to make. And I think it may change depending on who your potential workforce is in your region. But these are the sorts of things I think that should be considered as the first step in looking for uh, more recruits. 
Very, very good uh, information there, uh, Adrian. Thank you so much for, for providing that. So, Rich and Mike, you know, as a supplier of technology to the print industry, Baldwin faces a lot of the same issues that its customers confront on the front line in their plants when it comes to attrition and finding and training a new generation of talent. So, from y'all's perspective, how has Baldwin's workforce been impacted in the, the past two-plus years since the pandemic started? Well, it's uh, thanks for, you know for allowing us to be here. But it's been a it's been an interesting uh, dynamic. I mean, uh, if if you know time time passes fast here, but when you uh, think back of when this first started, there was so much uncertainty about you know are we going to be open? Are we going to have you know or is our business going to be open? How are we going to you know is anybody that we do business with going to be open? Because our business, although um, a large portion of our business supplies the print industry, and and uh, we ebb and flow a bit with with that um, we also supply under industries, but we were seeing the same thing across the board. Uh, you know, immediately, you know, there was there was you know a lot of, of downtime of uncertainty. But then, you know, the skeleton crews started showing up. The the more the people got, you know, um, you know the components they needed or the the hardware they needed to to work from home. Uh, and so, slowly but surely, the communication and the in the contact and the you know, okay, what can you do? What can we do? Things uh, started to to come. Together, but we were fortunate that you know being being here in the Midwest, um, we didn't see um, you know when it was time to 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 get you know sort of the the factory back up and running and stuff. We we you know we did the normal things with social distancing and that sort of stuff, but pretty much everybody was willing to, to kind of come back to work. I think there was, a, you know, there again, the uncertainty creates uh, a little bit of, of fear. So we had a few concerns, uh, you know, people with concerns about contact and that sort of stuff. But for the most part, you know, we were able to get uh, up and running again within a, uh, within a week or two at a at a, and ex acceptable to the business that, that we had. And we didn't really experience a lot of order cancellations or, or anything like that. But one of the things that, so we got, you know, with the, with the, you know, condensed crews, with the kind of forced to work from home, there wasn't a lot of decisions to be made. The, the flexibility was kind of, kind of forced on you. But as we saw when we started coming, talking about coming back to the offices, coming back um, in, in, into the building with the, what I would call the, you know, non-production or kind of, you know, you can't do your job away from, um, away from uh, the site type, type folks that, um, for the most part, we were, you know, people were willing to come in, you know, there were a few that were apprehensive, but it, that's where we started the flexibility. Again, we weren't in a position to, that we were going to say, okay, if you, you can't come to the office, you know, you know, don't, you know, or we don't need you or anything like that. So I think that's where the, you know, the, the kind of the idea that you had to be flexible and then, you know, sort of fast forward to now, I think we, you know, you know, People adapt, businesses adapt. You know, industry definitely adapts, and 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 I think um, you know um, we've accepted that not everybody's you know willing, if not able, to work on kind of the the schedules we had before. So we're you know, and then I think. Uh, you know, fortunately, we've had the technology these days and we've upgraded our technology over the last couple of years that allows us to work from home. So I would say it's 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 created a, just the, the requirement for flexibility, getting more. I do think that we could do a better job of getting more creative in, in some, of the, some of these circumstances to attract talent, you know, and I hopefully we talk a little bit about that more in the in the podcast here. But that's where we're seeing the challenge uh, now is that we have, you know, our, our, our dedicated loyal uh, people or people who have been with us for a long time. We haven't, we've seen some attrition, mostly through retirement, uh, but we've been trying to be creative with that. Um, but that's, I think, moving forward, there, there need to be more of these forums and need to be more of these discussions about what is the right makeup for your organization and what are the realities of your organization that, that you need to confront and, and deal with. And I mean, really, the reality of it is like what we've seen when we've remained flexible and we've we've actually switched to some different shifts. We've done a couple other unique things to kind of get out of the, the, the norm or the status quo. Um, honestly, we've we've seen employees become more happy. We've seen production increase. I mean, for, for example, like my engineers, we went from getting things done at the very end of the day on Fridays to work in 410s. And now we're instead of getting things done at the end of the day Friday and then the 
purchasing and procurement and um, assembly can't pick it up till Monday. Now we're able to hand it off to them first thing Friday morning and kind of get a jump on it before that next week starts. So there's there's been some other kind of unexpected benefits to the to a lot of this flexible work schedules. And so so it's not a, it's it, I know we we talk about it in a lot of cases where it's it's different and it's not necessarily the norm, but there's I think when you open your mind to it, there's a lot of benefits to be had outside of what you would normally think of. I think that's right. I think what Mike says is really, really important and rich as well, which is flexibility is a hard thing for existing employees um, to wrap their heads around. Changing the shift, sc shift schedules affects their lives and they have to conform. But ultimately, I think most, if not all employees will see benefits that derive from that. But you have to open your mind to it. You have to be in a good place with your employees to ask them to take that leap of faith with you. Yeah, and I think I think there has to come, you know, again, working working from home, <laughs> you know, and you know, you see the you see the horror stories and the jokes on social media, you know, so that you know somebody's camera comes on and somebody's walking around in their their underwear or whatever, or you know, they're 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 not, you know, they're not wearing pants or something. But um, I think the reality of that is that we also have to build trust in in our employees, and and that if you if you're working from home, I, I working you know working from home or having that flexible work schedule, I think. One, yeah, you, you know, I, uh, we talked about a little about this earlier. Is you have to, you know, you have to have one. Is you have to have the skill set to work from home. Meaning, if you're, you know, people that are just starting with a company can't expect that day one. And I've never worked for your business before. Then I'm going to just be able to work remotely and and pick up on everything and and that sort of stuff. So it, I think that it, it, there has to be, you know, every every company is going to be different. But I think there has to be the consideration of who who can effectively work from home or not. Because at the end of the day, our our businesses do need to run. Uh, effectively, and and you know we're gonna you know we're gonna keep poking at them, and we're gonna keep adjusting till we till we get that get into that sweet spot. But I just think of us, you know, a situation we had with with one of Mike's um, engineers that he had left us prior to the pandemic because of he was driving a, a long way to work and gas prices weren't near as bad then as they were were now. But he left because he found an opportunity closer to home and it fit his you know his personal situation better. Great, great, great guy. And then during the pandemic, you know, we kind of got a uh, word that he was, you know, that might be interested in coming back. And we're all, we were already, you know, working from home and we were, you know, we already had this and we were, had a need for his position. So, you know, it was an it was an easy decision to say, yeah, come, you know, we, we want you back. But can you come to the office, you know, two days a week instead of, you know, five days a week? And then it's been a been a great, great, you know, uh, I, I think um, positive situation for us and for him as well. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean that that employee that Rich is talking about. I mean he's got a he's got two hours of of window time when he comes in during the day. So when he's working at home, and there's I don't have any issues getting a hold of him an hour before he would usually start or an hour after he'd usually start. I mean it's it's he's it's been very flexible in that aspect of we've basically just converted that time that he would be driving into time that now we can work and we can get things done so and he has all the same capabilities at home that he does in the building so yeah that's a that, i think that's a really good use case and example of what this can look like when you do introduce more flexibility for me I like being in the office a little bit more because I like the structure that it provides and I kind of need uh, maybe some of those parameters. And my dogs kept trying to be guests on the podcast and uh, they just really don't know a whole lot about printing technology. So they were not welcome guests. Uh, so, you know, being in the office worked well for me, but it, it, it all kind of just depends on, on the situation. So Rich and Mike, when you talk to Baldwin's printer customers about the different challenges that they're experiencing when it comes to hiring and recruiting um, what are you hearing from them and how are they seeking to remedy some of these uh, these challenges they're facing uh, and uh, obviously Adrian could probably talk for all day on this subject but we I think we're hearing that if, if you're in the print industry you you know, there's a there's a lot. You know, there's a lot of communication that goes, and it, it's a it's a there's a it's a it's a big big market. Don't get me wrong, but it also seems like to be a fairly small community um, uh, of people that know each other and stuff. And so, I think we're hearing the same thing that a lot of manufacturing type companies uh, would hear. I think I think every I think every 
uh, industry or business just through the nature of, you know, the, where, you know, where we're going as a society and, you know, you know, class changes and that sort of stuff is that there's always a desire or a need, um, you know, to automate or to, or to do more, you know, do more of less. And then especially the print industry. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of discussions over the years about, you know, the shrinkage, how much it's shrunk, how, you know, how much more it's going to shrink. But there has been, uh, you know, uh, it's a fact that, you know, it, it is smaller in volume than it, than it was before and the amount of hardware equipment that's out doing this printing. And along with that, you, you know, you just had a number of people that have left the industry, you know, a lot of it through retirement and a lot of through, and then uh, as, as Adrian mentioned, the aged workforce. So what we're seeing is a demand to try to do not more with less, but, but be able to accomplish, you know, the, the, the printing process with, without that extra person that was kind of always there before. So when, you know, you needed to run, kind of run around a press and, and make sure that you're keeping up with all the different, you know, manual settings and stuff. What we do is, uh, and, and, or the time it takes to, you know, do, you know, do make ready changes and that sort of stuff. What we do is we come in and we help um, make those things more efficient or automate the process. So most of our, um, across, you know, all the Baldwin and all the different products that, that, that we provide to the industry, we're either eliminating time that's required for somebody to do it. So it eliminating the need to pay somebody to do that particular function. You're eliminating uh, maybe uh, an expertise that, that you're doing it through a computer software program or that sort of stuff. So now that allows one person to be able to carry, cover two positions versus one, you know, sort of dedicated to a certain function of the press. So it's just those sort of things that we do. And then, and then especially from our standpoint, obviously we put a lot of automation or a lot of, 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 of software into our products, but our biggest is, uh, you know, we contribute to the time it takes to be able to turn your print job around. So be able to, to do uh, more or to get more or shorten your process uh, is really where our equipment comes in and, and plays a big role in the industry. So if you're shorting the, pro the process, you're able to get more stuff through with the same labor force that you currently have. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, the two biggest inquiries that I'm getting, I would say, over the last two years, and just what can our product offer is is really just um, automation, which is essentially just not having to have someone interfere with the process, and then how well we can we can interface with the process. Just so there's there's no there's no downtime or there's no having to train the next guy to be a, a specialist of our equipment. It needs to be user friendly. So. I would say, if I can interject, I would say this about automation and as it relates to recruiting new employees. Younger employees expect automation in their jobs. Younger employees also are digital natives and are comfortable with automation, software, and things like that. And so the transition to um, um, an older workforce and a younger workforce is also a transition to people who are really comfortable with automation. So automation does relieve the workforce numbers of people required issue, but it also can be attractive to people who are coming in because they like working with software. They like working on computers. And this is sort of a hybrid of that. You're in a manufacturing situation, but you're working with kind of sophisticated automation and you know software programs that make the job attractive. It's like a IT kind of position. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that leads to, you know, something that I, you know, if anybody's listening to this podcast uh, of, of that, you know, for, for people to know about the industry and, and, and again, not just, not just for our business, but for the industry in general, you got to remember, we're talking, you know, we're, we're saying printing. So somebody's like, oh, I don't want to go watch a press put ink on paper, but you could, you know, that's if you don't know the printing industry, there's an incredible amount of technology within the industry that 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 we serve, and within the products that you know, its skill sets and and opportunities. I would say that 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 go into that. One of the, you know, 
it, it, just because you you know you get an entry level job, I think everybody in every company expects to kind of work up through the company, and and I don't think that that people think about all the different kinds of functions or jobs that are related to um, to some companies. Like you know, I'll, I'll let Adrian do it in the in the in the in the print industry world, but for like for our company, you know, we have Mike. We have you know, he started as an industrial engineer. He's you know had the opportunity to work up uh, to an engineering leader, and we're you know we're a medium sized division of a much larger company that's part of you know a much larger three billion dollar company. And Mike, uh, you know, Mike has has done great with us, but he also has access to all the jobs that are out there on you know, our, our parent company's platform and everything. And, and he wouldn't be held back if he went out, you know, we'd be upset and I would go down to his office and yell out of him, you know, maybe not let him go, but you know, there's opportunity there if he chooses to go take it and, and whatever, but we have, you know, we have project management, we have engineering, we have three or four different disciplines in engineering from electrical to mechanical to industrial to software engineers. You know, we do, we, you know, we have mechanical assembly, I have a electrical assembly, we have test engineers, we have, you know, we have machinists, we have a, you know, that we run out here. So, um, uh, you know, just because, you know, may come into our business and it's an entry level and maybe you start out as an assembler or maybe you start out in our, in our, in our parts business, you know, our, 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 our shipping and receiving business doesn't mean that there, there's not an opportunity to grow in that. And I think that exists in all companies. And I think, I don't think we do a great job of really promoting that to um, to the younger generation or, or people that say, so you, you know, you, if you want, if you really want to work in software, we'll give you an opportunity. And then again, I think another success story. And one of the reasons, you know, uh, I think Mike's on here with us is he's got another, um, another p member of his team that started, you know, in, 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 as an assembler. And we found that that person just picked up on stuff really fast. And, and then he, you know, it's like, Oh, I can do this or I can do that. And it turns out, you know, he, he has an, associate's degree and a discipline that we were, you know, that we were in need of. And we created, you know, we, we started talking about it. And although it was really valuable to our assembly crew, we created a path uh, for him to get into the engineering department. So again, another, I think, great success story of, 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 you know, taking an opportunity and giving somebody an opportunity to move up through your organization. And I think that's, that's critical in the future as well of these other subjects is allowing somebody, you know, uh, not everybody can, can, you know, sort of <laughs> realize the dream and, you know, get, you know, and move up. But for a lot of people, if you're in, in our company, it's particularly um, at our corporate level focuses on that. And we're, you know, we, we, we identify the people that want to move and we start to create those pathways uh, for them to do that. So, Yeah, Adrian, one of the things that's that's commonly said about younger generations and, and newer generations entering the workforce is they want to have a sense of, you know, meaning in their job, but also have more of a path perhaps laid out for what does it look like for me to advance? What is the next 20 years, if I enter this career, what, what might it look like? What could it look like? Have you found that that is um, something that's important at all, kind of to, to, to Rich's point, just that ability, that, that upward mobility within a company and knowing if I enter here, there's a potential that one day I could get to here? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rich touched on like five things that I could talk <laughs> for an hour about all five of them. So to, to slim down the conversation, I'll speak kind of in bullet points. The first is, um, I, I want to go backwards to a different point before we get to the point about mapping a pathway. We do a terrible job in the printing industry of showing how cool the pin printing industry is. So there is absolutely, we, each company has to market ourselves and our product out not only to our customers, but to our potential workforce and just show how cool these things are. We don't work in a grimy place that's deafeningly loud and covered with black ink dust. That's not how it looks anymore, but that's what the old age old idea of printing industry is. So that's a, a one important point. The second point is we absolutely have to do a better job of showing people that this is a career. It's not just a job. We're not here to just suck you dry. We are here to grow you as an individual and as a professional. So you might enter in the warehouse, but if you look and see things interesting to you within the production floor or pre-press, 
let's offer let's offer positions and education opportunities to young employees so that they can grow within the company and move on up and someday maybe they can be the president of the company there is um, a fast food chain that does an outstanding job of showing how you can start chopping lettuce for uh, the burritos and end up being an owner in a five-year time. They map it out on their website. Look, you can do this when you walk in the door, you're chopping lettuce, but five years from now, you can own a franchise and be making a six-figure income. We have to do better about that in the printing industry and show that there are opportunities. And honestly, we have to train ourselves to look for people, like Rich said in his examples, who show promise, who show an aptitude and may not know to ask about, hey, I'm really good at this sort of thing. Is there a job that speaks to these skills? We have to be really good at identifying talent once they're inside the building. We try really hard to identify it outside the building and get them in. But we have people inside our shops right now that can continue to grow and fill positions. So that's a really important step. I will tell you that millennials worked and created the gig economy largely. Gen Z doesn't want that. They want more stability. They see how hard it is for millennials, how, you know, purchasing of homes, retirement accounts, things, benefits that come with having that sort of traditional job structure, 401k, things like that. And they see how hard it is to juggle all of those different roles in, when you're in a gig position and not be able to earn that kind of additional compensation in your retirement or, you know, other benefits, paid time off. So they want that. Gen Z is coming out of school now and they want those things that Gen Xers had. They're not as in, um, entranced with the gig economy. So we have a real opportunity here to um, meet people where they are and provide to them flexible workplaces with a career path and offer them those great benefits that including paid time off and retirement and insurance and all those things because they really want it. They, they really want an easier path. They don't want to grind it out anymore. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a really interesting point. Um, and being in the millennial generation, I've, I've seen a lot of this firsthand with friends, acquaintances, th things along those lines. That, that's, a, that's a really strong point, Adrian. Mike, uh, you uh, being, I, I suppose, um, you have not been at uh, at Baldwin quite as long as Rich, so maybe you can you can share a little bit about your experience and how you see that pathway laying out for yourself, and maybe one day you 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 know aspire to have a job like Rich's or, or something like that. Give us your perspective on this. Well, I mean, my perspective, especially here at Baldwin, I mean, we, I would, I couldn't, I, I guess I couldn't tell you that I would have thought that I'd be in an engineering management position. What? seven years out of being out of college and really actually four years out of being out of college um, was when I was promoted. And, and honestly, I don't, this isn't the end. Um, I can see myself growing with Baldwin because of the Baldwin support. And I mean, we, we offer training, we offer um, mentorships. We, we've, we've got a very good program to kind of, to build that pathway for um, not only just young leaders, but people that are interested in taking the next step in their, their career path to get into the next position or to maybe find out where that ceiling is. And um, I guess from my perspective, I I don't see the ceiling yet. I mean, I, I definitely plan on growing a lot more within Baldwin. So. Excellent stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's really well put, Mike. Uh, Adrian, we talked about promoting from within, and we've kind of talked about that career path. But for people or for companies that are looking outside for candidates, are there resources, are there places that you would recommend going to, to continue to find and maybe cultivate uh, new job candidates and to find that next generation of talent? Yeah, absolutely. And, and as a precursor to the information I'm going to give you, the statistic that I want everybody to take away from this is that since 2007, there's been a 20% decrease in the birth rate in the United States. We're talking a lot fewer employees uh, 10 years from now coming out into the workforce than there used to be. So right now, we're actually increased the workforce over the past 20 years. It it's, doesn't seem like it, but we have added people to the workforce. And right now, there's 165 million people working. So we're at full employment, and we have more people in the workforce than we've had than we had 20 years ago. It just doesn't feel like it. So we need to look for employees 
um, in places where other people aren't looking and we need to maximize those opportunities now and in the future. You have to play a short game and you have to play a long game. And so the short game and the long game have elements of the same thing. You need to develop relationships with overlooked communities. Um, I like to talk about looking at the second chance hiring opportunities. These are ex-offenders who have re-entered the workforce who are really looking for a chance, an opportunity. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should go recruit um, offenders who have violent pasts. That's not what I'm saying. But look, our society has progressed a lot in how it looks at drug crimes, and there are legalized uh, situations now that people spent 10 years in prison for. So, you know, it's an apples to oranges sort of treatment to an apples to apples situation. So these are the sorts of candidates who can't get jobs, who are overlooked, who are really looking for an opportunity. There's a lot that comes with second chance hiring to make it a successful um, program, but, but the first and foremost, that's the place to look because there's a lot of opportunity to find people there. Um, my company, Printing United Alliance, uh, we actually, me and another person, created a 50-state chart of every single second chance hiring op, uh, organization in every state in the United States. If you um, click on our resources, find your state, click on that, and you can see places where you can start that process and create those relationships. That's number one. Number two is the disabled community. There are a lot of people with disabilities who are absolutely able to work in our workplaces. We don't give them enough of a chance by looking for them and they have taken rejection so long that they may have quit looking. So developing relationships with disabled hiring organizations in your area is very important. I also have a list of those resources on my website for people to use. The third place is veterans. Veterans are a rich source of great employees. These are people who who typically like to work with their hands, who would fit well in a manufacturing environment, who are really good at learning things because that's what they did the whole time they were in the military, and who are very good at taking direction in order to be trained on new equipment or new roles and new positions. Again, there are tons of veterans hiring organizations and I have those resources on my website, but there are some in every community in the United States of America, just about every community, certainly every county, if not city. So those are the top three, second chance hiring disabled workers and veterans. After that, you have a very rich resource in underserved communities. These people are typically, these communities are typically in urban environments and our facilities are typically not in urban environments. So we do have issues to confront when we recruit there with transportation and things like that. So, but there, there are ways to do that and I can, again, could talk for a long time about it, but I won't. But keep in mind that there are challenges, but they can be overcome with some relatively straightforward solutions. So that's another opportunity. And lastly, the immigrant communities where there are language barriers. That prevents a lot of people from applying for jobs, but it, by the simple act of hiring one person from the community to act as an interpreter and to maybe t offer English as second language classes, you can then tap into an entire community of workers who would be able to staff your company and get their friends and families to staff the company. And suddenly you have an influx, a sudden influx, and a constant um, pipeline of workers through that community. So that's the short game and the middle game. The long game is to become an employer of choice. Look at all of your benefits and get very involved in your community. And if you treat your employees well, workers will come to you. They will look to you when they're looking for a change because they have a friend that works for you and that friend speaks so well of their experience at your shop. So then they'll say, well, is there anything available? Is there anything open there? I'd like to come there. Make it so that you're the company in the company town. You know, have the table at the Independence Day celebration and the Veterans Day celebrations and give away the tchotchke and sponsor the Little League teams. That's the long game. The long game to become an employer of choice in your community.
Well, I'm glad to see that we're following the the right pattern. Uh, Mike's a veteran, by the way. Um, and then Mike is also, and again, I, I, I don't know how it happened that Mike was the really the superstar that we got on here. It was just, we were trying to fill a spot, I think. But uh, anyway, he, with Mike, one of the things that is probably uh, not known that it, they're not on his, his, his team, but they're in the company is that he's, he's recommended our company to a close personal friend, a close a uh, friend of the family, an extended uh, kind of a extended family, but not blood related. And even uh, he's gotten his uh, or not gotten, but his his father uh, through his recommendations started working for one of our sister companies. So um, it, that, it, it that is how you do it. That is how you do it. You become an employer that everybody likes to work at. And and, you know, People ask me about my job. They're like, "Well, oh, you seem pretty happy at your job. You know, are they looking for anybody? I mean, that hap that's just, that's how it happened in the old days. And it's not just posting a job opening on Indeed. I cannot stress to you enough that that is the least effective. You may find people, but you're going to go through so many hundreds of resumes to get the person that Mike got by saying, hey, I work at a really good place. You should look at well, it. And then, you know? Adrian, you hit the nail on that. That's that's exactly how all of these, I mean, Rich just mentioned three, but I think I'm actually up to seven referrals now. Um, and, and it's all through all different functions of our building and our sister companies is it's, we've been talking on hunting trips. We've been talking to family get togethers of what do we do? And it's, it's really just discussing what I do here and what we do here. And, and honestly, a, a position comes up and, and I basically sent out a group text and most people apply and, and are interested. And then it goes, one thing leads to another. So. And that can happen in every printing company in the United States of America. It can absolutely happen. Make your company a place where people are happy. If your people are happy, they will spread that love and your company will benefit tenfold from whatever investment it took to get people to that point of happiness. We, we must have a referral fee that I'm not, or, you know, reward that I'm not aware of. So seven, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but also just to, just to, to circle back a little bit, one category you didn't, you didn't mention that, that I think we've had some success with is the retirement community. Again, this is. Oh, I can talk for a long time <laughs> about I would, our I would mature the, employees. You know, it, it, the part of the, you know, the name of this podcast is looking, you know, for young, you know, getting young people into the industry. But, you know, one of the things that I always tell everybody is I, I value experience, you know, experience is, is, <laughs> is more costly in a lot of cases in almost every case. But when you do have, I would recommend to people when you do have somebody that's talking about retirement, have a conversation with them and find out if that's really, you know, if that, that's really what to do. We all know the stories of somebody retires and goes and doesn't do anything or sits on the couch or, you know, doesn't really necessarily have the means to go you know, travel the world or, you know, live at their lake house or whatever those uh, uh, things are. But we've had some success on people that, yeah, they wanted to slow down or they wanted to step away from the day to day, you know, could be the, the demand, the drive, the requirements, or they had a personal need that, that that they could afford to get out. And so that personal need caused them to. And so we've been flexible to those. And so everybody that anybody that approaches us that says they're thinking about retiring, we say, are there any, you know, is there anything that we can still get you know, the value of your expertise um, uh, uh, to contribute to the business. And one, and one more point to that, I've found that when you, you could have had one of those, those, those people that that's now, a, you know, a, a senior, a called a senior employee that sees other people coming up behind them and maybe get feels a little threatened. So they're not sharing they're they're maybe not as open as they should be. Once they get into that, you know, other, you know, what I would call more protected role, we're seeing them being a lot more open, their willingness to, to teach and share and train others, because they know that's not, you know, they're still, they're still, you know, getting some reward for it and still participate in the business. But it's not the same thing as, you know, I'm holding on to my job versus I know I'm in some sort of transition phase and happy to happy to share and happy to help. So yeah. yeah, that Rich, that's exactly what I advise people to do. Your retirees may not actually be delighted to, to be retiring. They may be retiring because it's just the physical toll of the job is, is a little much, or they have other responsibilities that they have to address. And like you said, they can afford to leave, but they want to stay connected. You know, they want to uh, continue to be part of that work family that they were a part of for so long. And let's not kid ourselves. A little pocket money is always nice too when you're 
retired. So having that shared knowledge, I would not only pull people, um, keep people attached if you can in a training role, in a mentoring role, but then they can fill in on shifts when people are on vacation or you're a little light because there's a flu that passed through the building. Then, you know, one of your employees who has retired but is still attached to the company, still does work for them, might be more than happy to step in for a week or two to cover the gap. And suddenly your jobs are getting done on time. You're not um, behind schedule on all of the things that and deadlines that were uh, looming ahead. And honestly, again, this is another situation where a really happy retiree or quasi retired person will speak so well of you in the community and encourage other people, not just to look for employment there, but the people who are there to stay because they see how you treat people as they go through their career. And there is ageism out there, right? We really value the knowledge of our older employees, but what are we doing to try and make their lives easier? We need to automate. We need to buy the uh, pallet wrappers. We need to not grind them into a physical, um, painful existence. We need to show them that we appreciate their, their work, their knowledge, uh, stay attached to them and try to make their job physically more able to be done by, you know, whether you buy like ergonomic grips on machines, these are small changes that can keep people active for much longer in the workplace. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mike was trying to keep it a secret, but his referral bonus is actually parked out in the parking lot right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I know the truck he's bought, so um, yeah, he's doing all right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, uh, we could. I, I think we could go for probably three to five to ten hours on this particular episode, but unfortunately, we probably need to start wrapping things up. But I think we should get some some final thoughts from everybody here on the podcast today, just to help synthesize things down a little bit more for listeners. And so, um, Adrian, I want to start off with you. You kind of started off uh, by telling us a few of the things that you hope that listeners walk away with. Bullet point those things for us again and kind of just give us some closing thoughts and, and some closing bullet points people can walk away with. Yeah, so I think the two most important things to walk away with are flexibility, and that's flexibility in who you consider to hire. It's flexibility in your shift schedule. It's flexibility in your benefits. That's really important. So flexibility across the board, that's your buzzword. The next thing is to find employees in overlooked groups. And there's a lot of them, surprisingly. Don't just post an ad on Indeed, but play a short, medium, and long game by developing relationships with different um, affinity groups in your community. And become an employer of choice by treating your people really, really well at all stages of their career. Get people by showing them they have a future and a career, that it's not just a job and map it out for them. And at the tail end of people's careers, treat them with respect, keep them involved and linked to the community in a training and mentoring role. And I believe that you will have greater success in becoming the employer of choice in your region. Excellent stuff. Mike, final thoughts? I know, well, I think Adrian kind of hit them all in the head. I would say for for anybody, any employers that are struggling to to kind of either re retain or get talent, um, just open kind of open up your mind. Think of what what can you do or what what can what can be done that can keep the business running, running effectively and efficiently, but then also um, kind of sweeten the pot for someone to come and work for you versus the next guy. Um, and I, and I think that's kind of the big thing is flexibility is is going to be a big a big part, especially with with a lot of the the great resignation that's been happening. And then, as Adrian commented on, that's going to be happening in the future here with 20 percent less less birth rate. So so be that company that, that people want to come and work for and stay at and grow with. So really, really well put, Mike. Yeah, I appreciate those thoughts. Rich, final word for you here today. Uh, wrap us up uh, with your final thoughts. Yeah, I would just say, you know, don't, you know, one is starting wages have been as, as high as they've ever been. So, and just bec just because you start at a certain pay doesn't mean that's the pay you're going to end at or the pay you're going to st uh, stay at. And, and and I think all employers are kind of uh, aware of that these days in, in industry, in manufacturing companies, in companies that, you know, that are, you know, Work has to be done at a facility and those things. That's the reality of life. Not all, not everyone can, can, can get a job that is going to start, 
you know, at home and, 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 and at a high pay and all those things that come along with that. Yeah, it's usually a benefit of experience. But also don't discount the fact of, of in most companies and especially some of the larger companies, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, not just for growth, but opportunity to do different skill sets. And you don't necessarily have to come in as a trained professional X. There, most companies are willing to train and willing to help with, with that growth. And, and again, that's the difference between, you know, most companies have, you know, five or six different layers of the organization as far as, as you know, manufacturing, administration, accounting, you know, salespeople, and I can, I can, th you know, over the, over my career and, you know, even thinking about around our facilities and, and the Baldwin and Barry Waymiller facilities, I can, I can name dozens of people who are in a totally different role than, than they started doing a totally different, you know, aspect of a job in their career. And they, and, and they've, you know, it, it may not be the, it, you know, for some people, it may be the pinnacle of their career path or where they thought they were going, or it could be just another step uh, to, a, to a longer trail. So, you know, and as, and as we said earlier, as, as, as print companies and as manufacturing companies, especially the print industry, we have to promote the technology and, um, the 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 value and the, and all the things that, that we bring to the industry and don't be afraid of technology don't be afraid of learning a new technology because it's just a natural part of evolution of most industries and i think we're seeing that today in in ours well, fantastic thoughts uh, from everyone here on the podcast today. I mean, it has just been uh, an incredible conversation, and I think we only scratched the surface of what we could have, uh, all the things we could have talked about, but uh, we might have to just have everyone back on for part two, part three. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out at some point, but it's been an absolute pleasure having you all here on the podcast today. So Adrian Harrison, Rich Bennett, and Mike Nelson, thank you all so much for joining us here on, uh, on this episode of Baldwin's Unlocking Potential podcast series. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Tyler. Absolutely. And everyone, thank you for tuning into another episode of the podcast. We appreciate it very much. Of course, for more, you can always visit the Baldwin website or subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to stay up to date with the latest from Baldwin. We have conversations like this as well as uh, for, for lots of different areas of the printing industry. So you want to make sure to subscribe to stay up to date with the latest from the show. And stay tuned. We'll be back soon with more episodes of the show. But for this one, for my excellent guests, I've been your host today, Tyler Kern. We'll talk to you again next time. 